Welcome to Super Life with me, Darren Olean, a podcast where we explore, discover, and share solutions that promote a healthier life and a better world. Together, we'll ignite possibilities, inspire change, and build sovereignty, creating a roadmap towards a super life for you and for all. Get ready to start living your super life. Yes, thank you for having me. That's so, so good. great. I was I was reflecting on the way over. Got it randomly because I, I I was in a zone where I just go I just want to learn some stuff, right? And I found whatever the. the I even the thing of noticing conference. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it was just like fun, and I just sat back in the corner and like took a bunch of notes, and you popped on. It was like. Oh shit! <laughs> you just brought it right, and uh, I was doing some stem cell stuff with some guys, and then I was like, "And that's a thing." So the pro prolo therapy is what got me because I was working with his name was Dr. Raven. It's Tom Ray, Tom Raven, in the nineties. Yeah. And so we were working with post prolo therapy accident people and we were looking at movement therapies and trying to get people back because they, they had an accident of some kind. Mm -hmm. So I was fascinated with movement, kinesiology and nervous system stuff. And so I was working with the physiologist. We got to know Ray, right? Had some prolo. So when I heard, cause very few people talk about yeah. prolo therapy, right? And you were like, you were like, <laughs> I was you excited. Know, yeah, you were scissor hands. So like you were like, so so that's where it was, it was it was really cool. But you're not doing that anymore. I left my practice right yeah. before the pandemic hit. So wow. right before conveniently, you sniffed it. I did. Before. I did. I walked into my assistant's office in 2018, and I said something's coming, and I don't want to be in practice when it happens. So. Wow. Yeah, it took me like two years to get out of practice because patients didn't want to leave. Like, there was like a timeline of sort of slowly but surely getting out, you know, getting out of it. And then, because I was I had a very successful practice. And, right. You were doing some cool stuff. Yeah. And then I, yeah, 2020 had out. Because you were targeting, you were one of the first people I knew that was targeting direct joints with uh, ultrasound, like, you were, you were, were you, you, I mean, you were doing some very effective pain stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I was good at it. Yeah. And then I was teaching other doctors how to do it, and right. I had a whole thing going. Yeah. But I don't know. It, it, I haven't missed any of it. I haven't missed one thing. Like, it was a whole thing. I was really, I, I feel like I, God gave me a gift to do it, and I was a lot more very upset when I walked away from it. But I just knew it was good. I didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> Well, I know, but I really have a knack for. I'm a chiropractor too, so I have good hands, and like I have a knack for it. And my mentor taught me, you know, raised me up. Like I had a mentorship. I had all of this, and I tried to teach as many doctors as I could how to do sort of my way of doing things. And then I, I don't know, I just got totally burned out on seeing patients. Yeah, it's a whole thing. It's like I love food. Start a restaurant, and then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, like, Oh, I love it. A lot of people, it's a lot, of, it's a lot of stuff to hold a clinic together. Yeah. It's just people don't understand. It's a lot of stuff. You're, you're, you're good at your thing, but then you're the CEO, you're the marketing person. You're trying, you're, you're a, a, a psychologist with your own staff. Like it's, it, and the patients and it's like a full on thing. So. And pain mm -hmm. is particular, like dealing with patients in pain. Um, and that's the shock life, I think that I. I hit, and I'm really empathic and clairvoyant, so I could feel all of it. And I just remember one day, I gotta do something else. Sure. I, just, I just didn't want to be at a clinic anymore. I had a very sick kid. I'd spent my entire life in and out of doctor's offices. Right. Then I'd spent my entire life working in medicine. I mean, I was doing Alzheimer's research up at an Oregon Alzheimer's at University in undergrad, and on through and working for my mentor, and then going to school, and building up my own clinic. And finally, I was like, I wonder what life is like outside of medicine, you know? And then I can just, I feel like I can help way more people with an online platform. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. but you're very articulate, which was one of the first things I noticed, right? You could articulate very complex things and you could deliver that information to the way that people can understand that. And if you have an authority in it, you studied multiple modalities. And, and also, the thing that I've always found so great with you is common sense. You, you flip on the common sense going, hey man, you set it up. Go, you know, does this make sense? And 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 you can articulate. And that's you know, I think we've lost a little bit of our common sense and uh in the world. Um and we need to flip those switches back on. And those of us that want to flip them on, let's flip them on, right? And that's also what comes through with you. Thank you. Um I wanna jump through like some fast kind of question. Okay. And let's and then it jump us into a world of bunch of things, metabolism, et cetera. So myth or fact, our metabolism slows down with age. Oh, that's such a loaded question. <laughs> it's hard to answer quick. <laughs> so many hormonal shifts happen as we age. Especially women, right? Yes. That adds to a lot of insulin resistance. I mean, I really think that women entering the menopause are going to be metabolically compromised no matter what they do. Mm -hmm. And men too, but particularly women with the drop in estrogen. And then you add to that the way that estrogen inter interacts with thyroid receptors and you add to that fat distribution and actually estrogen dropping. I just read this fascinating study. I just did a podcast off about it yesterday on my own podcast. Just the changes to the adipocytes. Mm -hmm. So the fat cells themselves shift and become more inflammatory. Mm -hmm. All that said though, our metabolism doesn't directly slow down. So it's kind of a mixed bag. We're, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle, but that's kind of, and yes, if we put all that together, we could say, well, that leads to what seems to be cellularly slow metabolism, but no. So let's just, let's just spell it out. A little bit because from your perspective, from the lay person's, what's metabolism? Because people think they know what it is, right. but then there's different, okay, there's metabolism, but then there's metabolic health and there's like, and there's dysfunction, but the dysfunction is inputs and other things affecting other things, which is ironic because we want to reduce everything down and have an answer, but there's a lot of things. So, so with that, what is metabolism? Metabolism is our ability to turn the food that we're putting into our mouth into cellular energy efficiently. I mean, that's, you know, basic yeah. definition. Yeah. And so having an insulin sensitive cell, being able to get that cell to translocate the GLUT4 receptors of the memory to take in glucose to be used as fuel. And then our mitochondria would essentially be working efficiently and turning that into ATP, which is our cellular currency, and all of that would work well in a perfect world. <laughs> but we have toxins and we have stress and we have lost our connection to primal ways of living and we have all the things, right, that lead to a disruption in that circuitry. And so, and then we have, you know, what do we come to the table with? I think that's really forgotten and underappreciated, like, what happened to me all these years leading up to this point? And, and how does that play into it? Adverse childhood events, traumatic, you know, uh, health crashes, what have you. All of that leading up to how your cells are behaving in this time and space. And so, you know, in different infections that we maybe have had, mold exposures, whatever. And it all adds up to how your metabolic health is presenting itself. And that's not always very efficient, even right. with best efforts. Right. So on the one hand, if, if we looked at metabolic health, it really, it doesn't, it's not affected or it's, if it, if it works well and it's, there was no other negative inputs, it's going to do its thing. Yeah. People are active and yeah. active like humans are supposed to act. Right. But that's not the current, right? And right. that's not the current situation. Right. So it's a it's a both answer, right? It's yes. it's a it's a because I always say this all the time. 
because you know I, I i do use this argument i don't force plant-based on anybody but i do go okay but where where are your where your food is coming from what it, it's exposed to what it has in it is you know almost every fish you know has heavy metals yeah every mammal has pfos yeah uh, like including us so so it's like the one hand of the, where the paleo conversation goes awry is that that doesn't represent what is actually going on in the world today. So that being said, we have all these other inputs. So what, I guess, what are you seeing with the metabolic conditions as a result of what's going on today? People are just getting sicker and sicker and sicker. I was just talking to a colleague yesterday. I was on her podcast and she specializes in uh, chronic illness and really complicated cases. And interestingly, her mentors, her mentor was my mentor's mentor. So Dr. Klinghart was her mentor. You've probably heard Dr. Klinghart yeah. and Dietrich Klinghart. And then he mentored my mentor. Who mentor. So it's just like, we have a similar lineage, although different training and different, we took different routes, but. Sounds like some sort of shower. <laughs> <and, and>, uh, <laughs> no, lineage. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, we figured yeah. this out in an event and we were like, yeah. I was like, where are you? And I knew she was an English product doctor, Dr. Uh, Christine Schaffner, she's in Seattle. Anyway, we were talking about how sick people were from when we started. We started out in practice at a similar time and to where we are today and how much more complicated things have gotten. Yeah. And so I think. You know, I can tell people to strength train and I can tell people to eat adequate protein and go out in the sun and do all the things, but I really don't think it's fair to compare one person to another because we're different genders and we're different ages. And like you and I were exposed to an entirely different uh, system of vaccines, to an entirely different system of medications and food supply than my daughter's generation, right? Whole different bag. And so, and I'm seeing my daughter's generation, she's telling me, she's like, well, my friends are also sick. Everybody has severe gut issues and the doctors aren't doing anything for them. They just get antidepressants. I mean, it's just a hot mess. And being someone who's been in the medical system is either a patient or working in it pretty much my entire life. Like for literally, I mean, I was that sick kid that came out the chute and was like, my mom followed me around from doctor to doctor. The whole system's got crazy. And it was one of the reasons I wanted to get out of practice was I couldn't believe how sick people were. It was so much more complicated to, you know, used to be able to give somebody some fish oil probiotics and set them straight. What? <laughs> you know, that's not the case anymore. So I think it's just complicated, but we can do what we can do. And we all have a personal responsibility to put in as much work as we can with the tools that we have and take care of this vessel that we have because this is our meat suit and we only get one and to write it off and say oh the doctors will save us so the government will intervene and save us or it's not my responsibility or i'll just eat whatever whatever it doesn't matter you know that way of thinking doesn't work and we have to take responsibility for what where we're at i know we're all at different places and it's not fair how some of us got here it's not fair some of the shit that happened to me mm -hmm. and what it's done in my health but you know, I can do what I can do today and moving forward to take the best care of myself that I can. Yeah, in mean, society, it's not fair that we were we were born into it too. Like, right. We were born <laughs> into a toxic soup that was really accelerating. Quite yes, rapidly, it's right? really toxic. And I know you talk about this all the time and people yeah. just don't realize what they're swimming through and then what they're adding to it yeah. on top of it is such a disaster, especially young women. I'm, I'm shocked at the amount of crap i don't even know how they afford it but just the nails and the hair and the makeup and that all the things right and i'm like and instagram's caught with these like seven step skincare routines and, everybody yeah everybody and like i i'm like yo we gotta slow our world and they're injecting i mean i cannot believe the amount every single week every single week i have a girlfriend who's in the health space tell me that they're getting an explant of their breasts and i'm like y'all have fake boobs in your own health. And I'm not judging anyone, but I mean, I just would have honestly been surprised. I was like, I didn't realize this many natural health practitioners are rocking implants and then they're going in the sauna, you know, and I, again, I'm not judging anyone. And it's been completely, yeah, it's been completely normalized. And I'm like, wow, this is really adding up to a lot of, just a lot. <laughs>
<laughs> a lot. Uh, well, with like, no, you know, I've got bruises on my fingernails because I never, I'm putting my nails last night and I'm like, I'm just going to see Darren and he'll appreciate it. I've, yeah. I've never done nails. I've never done, I've done a little bit of filler. I've done a little bit of Botox, but like there's a massive amount of shit going into people every day, especially women. And then we wonder why they get my age and it all falls apart. And they're like, what happened? Everything fell apart. I'm like, well, what has been going on for the past 20 years? Well, that's the, it's, it's changed by a thousand cuts. And, and the, you know, it's like the, the body, the mechanisms are so good, so resilient. The fact that, you know, metabolically, we barely have what, 10, 12% ish people that are healthy, Mayo you know, Clinic did. A kind of a general health, like I think it was, they came up with 2.7% for deep healthy and oh, right. like, so you're like, what? Like, and then those quintessential pictures of the sixties and seventies of people on the beach and then here, and it's like, holy shit. Right. So, so on the one hand, okay, we know this, what do you think? And it's, and it's really. It's really, I, I think it's your mission too. It's awakening kind of out of the, 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 the lull and the, 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 I'm just going to grab whatever. And then you're habitually in your life and you're not questioning the fragrance, the laundry. So the conditioner, the, the thing, and, and then saying, oh, you're, you're getting hammered. Yep. And their metabolism is gone sideways and they're over here trying to figure out their macros and their exercise. And I'm like, why not the $18 Erewhon smoothie that you're drinking out of a plastic cup with a plastic straw every single day? You know, like those are the things I think about. And I, I, I don't know, call me hippie. I am, I'm just kind of a hippie at heart, you know, and I was, my mentors were all hippies. And I mean, truly, you know, old school hippies. And, it's, it's the little stuff that I'm so surprised. It's, it's like, I'm over here doing, and here I'm looking, I'm wearing some polyester clothes, I know, but <laughs> we've talked about this. <laughs> but they're sweating in significant polyester, drinking out of plastic cups, and over here with, the, and their faces are, I mean, they're in their 20s, these women sometimes in thirties with their faces like glass. They're so Botox and filled. They all look very much look the same. And then having conversations about like clean skincare and online. It's it's very confusing, I think, too. So I think it's confusing for young women coming up, but I'm just all of that to say when you hit I don't know how old I think you're a little bit older than that. I'm fifty. Yeah. So when you hit our age, it it goes sideways real fast. So that's a culmination of decades of you know, my mom is a great example. My mom, yeah, I was been a hairstylist since I was, I think, three, four. And when she hit her 40s, it was night and day. She went from being a size four, like a true size four, not a van, you know, vanity sizing four like we have nowadays, but old school 1980s size four to blowing up into severe metabolic dysfunction. And it was my mentor who diagnosed her with syndrome X at the time. It was called syndrome X and it was just metabolic syndrome. We didn't have a term for it. And the metabolic syndrome really is this culmination of symptoms that anybody can screen themselves for. I have a free guide on my website where you can look at the international guidelines, right? And it's like, is your waist circumference above a certain size? Are your triglycerides elevated? Is your blood pressure elevated? Um, there's a couple different markers. and. So many people, when I got into clinical practice in 2008 was when I officially had a license and I started running labs on everybody, the same labs, and everybody had metabolic dysfunction. And I'm running serum insulins on them, blood, you know, glucose levels, and you know, inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, hemoglobin A1C, and everybody's a little bit messed up. Or I'm seeing glenars or the triglycerides are high in relationship to the rest of their lipids. And I'm like, what's going on here? And my colleagues were giving me shit saying, Dr. Tina thinks everybody has metabolic dysfunction. I'm like, yo, everyone that I'm running, that I'm, if you go looking, which I am, everyone seems to have metabolic dysfunction. And here we are, however many decades later. And that 2018 data was what showed that 93, 94% of US adults have plastic cardiometabolic health. And that was 
released in 2021, so I can only imagine what's happened since the lockdowns. In many states, like I'm from Oregon, where everybody literally got locked in their house for way too long. So we're sitting in a pickle, and then we're wondering why all the cardiovascular disease, why all the poor outcomes from COVID, why we have young people presenting with crazy high rates of colon cancer. Why, why, why? It's such a mystery. You know, and I'm like, because we're generations into metabolic dysfunction. What do you think the biggest three to ten <laughs> drivers <laughs> of, of that, the, the, the things that range the highest problematic kind of signals for you leading to metabolic dysfunction? Mechanistically, from an individual point, so I look at the individual as, and I was this way, I was totally addicted to ultra-refined carbohydrates. I was raised up on ultra-refined car carbohydrates. So we've got dietary issues coupled with severe lack of muscle. You know, and people say, oh, kids aren't going outside anymore. I'm like, kids are not even building muscle. They're not laying down that initial layer, which is what keeps them, you know, like being muscled up as a kid, being a fit kid really translates into better health down the line. I'm absolutely sure of it. And so we've got that piece. And then to your, you know, point, toxicity, just people's toxic buckets are, everyone has an individual toxic load. Yeah. And I think the kids are hitting it and young people are hitting it earlier and earlier. And I don't know how much of that is environmental. Also the massive amount of vaccines that they're getting at a very young age compared to us, it's significantly higher. Yeah. So they're getting hit and maybe they're being put on a lot of medications early, which are, it, there's all kinds of byproducts and fillers and meds. I'm not saying if you need meds, you need meds, but you know, you're getting food dyes and all kinds of shit. So I think those two things coupled are probably some of the biggest drivers. And then all those toxins are endocrine disruptors directly. There's xenoestrogen. You know, so that's a massive, I mean, that was probably 20 years ago we were trying to talk about people didn't want to hear it. So. And then we've got glyphosate and, you know, Monsanto did that 20 years ago. I was trying to tell people, they're like, you need to calm down. And now, you know, the train has left the station and yeah. the food supply has drastically changed. And I'm like, okay, well, here we are dealing with all of these things. Yeah. And young folks are dealing with crazy levels of infertility and young women are getting breast cancer. Earlier, I am shocked at the amount of young women I know personally who are telling me, oh, I have, I have a tumor. I'm like, what? This is not, this is something that's in the environment that is going on that is. Well, I was so different from what yesterday. Like, it's good to help people all of our life. Everyone's got their issues, but. How old is she? 41. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty young. So it's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> it's yeah, crazy. You, you can't do it. You can't, you know, when you start, you know, I, I can get on a roll yeah. with this stuff too. And it's like, and it's, it's, it almost seems and feels impossible that this is the soup humanity has created for themselves. And I'd love to get your point on this and then we can zero back to metabolic health. I do find that when I look into something, it's not always nefar nefarious, right? Mm -hmm. It's not always, one can argue yeah. that I had a great conversation with Chris Hansen in the nineties. She was a PhD analytical, uh, engineer who was working for 3M and she started, they said, can you test the blood of our workers? And she set up the protocol to test the blood. She goes, well, okay, they have all these high levels of PFAS in their surprise breath. Oh, man. And so then she's trying to create a, a, a like a control. She couldn't find a control that existed in, in the human population. She had to go back pre-1950. Wow. To have they had, there was some military Korean blood samples. It was the only one well, that did that. But to her point, there's great people. My point is, there's great people in these companies that are trying to do the right thing. The problem is, the further up you go, 
plausible deniability. We're not going to do that. And they consciously make a choice that then affects everyone else below. So I, I, my optimism comes out going, I even believe and I, I've had some conversations with some people. I even believe that even the short sightedness of us as humans, I believe that Monsanto literally thought yeah. originally we're going to create a bunch of food for the world. Yeah. Right. I agree. And then at a certain point, the data, and then you either go, we're going to stop this program or we're going to double down. Right. And that's where it really takes a turn. So what are your. A double down. <laughs> we just had that happen in the past few years, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. It's a double down. Yeah. And humans inherently do not want to admit when they were fooled or wronged or were wrong themselves or promoting something was dangerous and wrong because they thought it was the right thing to do and people get into tribalism and groupthink and oh, it's 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 weird i'm i'm i've always been a loner and so i really have been able to step back and i don't know what it is i know humans instinctively want to follow the herd to feel safe but i've always been able to sort of sit back and be like something doesn't smell right here what's going on you know and not really care if i'm alone in it and like, oh, well, I'll take more chances as right. a lone wolf. And then I find other lone wolves. And yeah. We have, you know, <laughs> you I, I see you. Uh, we're friends. Yeah. But uh, I think, yeah, I think it's the double. And I think, I think that also we're incredibly resilient. I'm shocked. I'm shocked at how many people, I'm shocked at this uh, way some folks can live. Like the remarkable amount of poor health that they are enduring as an individual right. and yet they continue my dad i'm like how is this man still alive it's shocking to me and so there's something there about the resiliency of the human body and so you metabolism and i i don't know uh and detox abilities but that doesn't mean i'm gonna gamble and try to drive it up to the edge a good example is my daughter's friends they're like addicted to Febreze and all kinds of scents and acts. I don't even know. It's just a sense overload. And they want to sit there and argue sometimes with me about it. And I'm like, dude, you can like whatever you want. I'm just worried about your testicles and yeah. in case you have your looks in a few years. So we can sit here and split hairs, but I'm telling you in general, yeah. what you're doing is probably not helping your fertility. And if that matters to you, you might want to be concerned about it now. Like now we need to sign. And it's just, if it's not impacting them directly, humans are just not aware that it will impact them at some point, or yeah. they don't really practice harm reduction. It's just, you know, it's cute. We feel yeah. that. If I don't, if that's not cutting my finger and making my finger bleed. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. And I'm kind of looking down the line thinking, well, really, a lot of it's vanity. Yeah. Really? If we can get more people to tap into their vanity a little bit, you know, I'm gonna age well, but selfishly, I also, I mean, I don't know, selfish, I'm like, I have great relationships with my husband. I wanna go traveling, I wanna not hurt, I wanna have fun, I wanna, I've had so many health issues that have led to chronic pain, personally, like actual physical pain. And so my pain is my gauge. And I live probably in a, markedly higher level of pain than most people do, but maybe not for my age, because I think, you know, right around 45, we'll start falling off the car for a lot of folks. Our age cohort is not doing well. Um, but I think that they start to realize it. They get to our age and they're like, shoot, I really should have done some things differently. And there's a lot of regret and it's hard to turn that ship around. And so, like you said, when you're young and you think you're immortal, when you're older, my husband's always thinking too in terms of things, either life or death. And I'm like, no, I'm thinking about disability, slow, erosive disability and loss of cognition and not knowing who you are at some point in your life and having somebody wipe your ass for you. Do not want that in a wheelchair, not able to get up and down stairs or enjoy the beach or whatever. Do not want that. That's what I'm thinking about. And when I say vanity, that's what I mean. I just, I, it's not just, Oh, I want to look hot until I'm old. I don't care about that. I want to not be that version yeah. of me and still be alive because we are so easily. Like, you know, you want to function and have, and have, have a life that's fulfilling and, and fun. Yeah, fun. And yeah, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a 
it's a slippery, weird slope with being human because we are so damn resilient. Um, the, you know, nature is so resilient, you know, like, like, like Chernobyl. Like no one's living there, but there's plants and animals are back there and it's popping through concrete of apartments that were abandoned because it's toxic as hell. And you're like, holy shit, nature is strong in the face of our absolute stupidity. And I bet there's some cool DNA in those animals and in those plants. I bet there's something. Microbes are probably eating up some of that or metabolizing. There's some cool stuff. Mycelium, weird <laughs> ass stuff. <laughs> Or something. Like some good medicine is in there. For There's sure. the secrets. So it's, there we go. That's what we're doing. Let's There's your superfood. There's your next. <laughs> that's, that's good. It's a nice yeah. last. Okay, so this one has my suit ready. <laughs> and we're going to see what we find. And not get three eyes in the process. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk about what people can do to raise their metabolic condition right now. And then I don't want to talk about some other interesting stuff with weight loss, but metabolically, as people, because I want to give people a break from all of the stuff that they're hearing right now. Right? Right. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's facing things to change things. Yeah. Right. You, you, we have to know what's going on. There's a whole bunch of people, and they're probably not listening to our show, uh, your show, or my show. Uh, or anyone we know, because they want, they care. Yeah. They, 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 they care enough to go, I want to optimize my life. The other people, they're just tuned out. They're not going to, um, they're not going to tune it. So, so we have that audience that wants to look at this stuff. So what are some things that people can do right now that they may not be thinking of? Maybe they're working out right now. Maybe they're filtering their water. Maybe they're getting some good sleep. Maybe they're eating a good amount of, you know, whole foods and they're staying away from processed soup. Like those are some solid ones. What are some other things that you think people can do to ramp up their metabolic health? I think taking a very hard look at your stress levels and honoring those. And What's that? well, I think we, well, we were the generation that was raised up to be, you know, Stress is good for you. Yeah, just get, through. get three hours of sleep and right. hang in there and you're, you'll be fine. And I think young folks right now are really looking at real stress with the economy. I mean, there's young people working two, three jobs and they can't, just, they have no hope of even living on their own at this point. So, right. so stress can really run out of the station and you don't even know it. And I am a victim of that and I burn the candle at all ends for so long and then you hit middle age and you do not have the tolerance bands you used to have. You do not have the ability to mitigate that stress. And stress will destroy your insulin sensitivity and will destroy your metabolic health so quickly. It's so catabolic to have all that high levels of cortisol pumping through you. And it does terrible things to the rest of your hormonal profile. So I think looking at your stress, taking a good hard look at it and deciding, okay, I'm 45, I'm 50 years old. Do I want to continue down this path? Am I in a relationship that has been making me miserable for decades? Am I in a job that has been making me miserable for decades? Like, what are you going to do? Are you going to continue down that path and have an early demise? Or are you going to look at it in the eye and decide, like I did with my practice, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to change direction. I think that's a big one. I know you mentioned sleep, but I don't think people really appreciate how critical sleep is. And that's easier said than done. When your cortisol's all wacky and your hormones are all wacky, sleep can be elusive, especially for women. So considering bioidentical hormone replacement, I think is a big one. And I really want to emphasize that there is so many good studies coming out in more recent years showing safety profiles around those hormones. And if you put hormones into a metabolically optimized body, I have found clinically in my own personal experience that with thousands of patients, you really don't need much. In a person who has great muscle mass, who is eating good whole foods, who is doing all the things, as I call it, a little bit of hormone can go a long, long way towards longevity and keeping metabolic health intact because diabetes is on the other side of that for a lot of people. So I think those are two big ones that we sort of underappreciate. And then I think the third one would be relationships. 
with people. It's really easy to have our social circles get, and I'm guilty of this too, you know, things get smaller as we get older and we get more selective of who we want to spend our time with, you know, finding community and other like-minded folks is sort of the, you know, cheat sheet to not getting dementia. So we have to be, whether it's being involved in a church or some kind of spiritual group or art or whatever, but being around other people, getting that microbial interaction with good, healthy folks and having some kind of community in our life is underappreciated when it comes to overall impact on that wallet health. Those are some really powerful points that I think, you know, going back to stress, it, it is, you know, we've geared or so going back to the kind of the other side of being human, we get used to something like, just like when you said you're in the city and then you get out there, you know, like, oh, I didn't even realize, right? So our central nervous system, especially if we're challenged, we've had abuse with our central nervous system, when it's not healed, is also a heat seeking missile to find it again, Yes, which is such a messed up journey if you don't heal it properly right so then it's just seeking out more and more stress so like that part of it i think is the underpinning where it you almost have to get yourself out of your routine enough so that you can have a vantage point like for example you went to the city and went out in in the farm and like that was enough to go Holy shit. Okay. I okay, like the city. All right. <laughs> you... No, I didn't like the city. Exactly. So I was not in the city anymore. All right. So it's like, you have to break patterns in order to kind of expose, do you really like that? Right. Do you, is that what you really want? And, and are those the people you really, really care about? Are they coherent in your heart? Yeah. Like, you know, it's like, yeah. those, th those things are very powerful. I a lot of folks i know i did COVID hit and i you know you know how i i pushed back pretty hard and then i had a lot of people in my life turn on me and i was like i don't really like most of them anyway to be honest i don't really lose anyone i care about and a lot of folks drop out and i was like well that was easy yeah. i'm okay with that you know but then i had to find a new community i had to go out kind of quit being a hermit and i had to go out and find new people and venture out and that's part of the reason i am so enjoying traveling and being on different podcasts and getting to see my friends and make new friends because i need a community of like-minded people and not stay isolated for literally the like i said we need microbial interaction on the flip side of that, people need to take a good hard look who they are surrounding themselves with because our microbiomes are contagious, quite literally. And so unfortunately, and I, again, I keep referring back to sort of our age group, but I hear all the time from my followers, healthy, fit wife or trying to get healthy and fit husbands in terrible atrocious shape, living off of fast food and won't change anything. That is impacting her. Man, you are exchanging. Wrong. You're going wrong. You know what I mean? You keep reinfecting yourself, right? It's a thing. And then I here's something crazy. I don't think I talked about, about on any podcast yet. When I was in clinical practice, I was looking at my male patients. I had a lot of male patients. I I inherited my practice from my mentor who was like, you know, fit surper dude. Yeah. Older guy, had tons of fit older guys that he was taking care of. And I was like, sweet, this is easy. And they taught me so much actually about health, about hormones, about doing it right, you know? And I was just this chick in her thirties with all the, this is fun. the women, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the women too. And like all these really fit, healthy people and I'm doing hormone replacement and prolotherapy. And it was a really cool practice that I inherited. Sad way, he died of cancer, but um, I was looking one day at this couple that I treated and the woman was having all these issues and we were trying to get her hormones dialed in. And I'm looking at the guy and the guy's not that great. He's, he's as far as taking care of himself. He's, he's more of like, oh, I'll be fine. You know? And I'm like, dude, you're not fine. <laughs> and she's over there looking at me like, can we get him on the bandwagon? And he came in for a hormonal consult and I took a list of his medications and I was looking at them and I used to teach pharmacology in the naturopathic medical school. So I knew, uh, I'm sorry, the chiropractic college. I was, that was a funny story. I was in a traffic medical school and I was teaching oncology to chiropractors. Oh. So I was looking at his list of medications, thinking about the side effects and how 
that these drugs, when they go through first pass in the liver, they turn into metabolites, intermediates, and sometimes those intermediate metabolites are more toxic than the drug itself. And she was having some issues in her vaginal health. And I was starting to wonder, I wonder if these drugs are coming through him and going into her. And then I started paying attention. And I'm wondering if a lot of women are not actually getting dosed through the polypharmacy that their husbands are on, through intimacy. And not just, you know, we know that if you have parasites and you're sleeping in bed with somebody with parasites, you're probably gonna give them to each other, even just by being around each other. We know microbiome is contagious, but I really wonder how much of these pharmaceutical drugs that partners are on, especially male to female, are having an impact on sort of it's just a thought, and I've, you know, kind of gone a rabbit hole on it, but I think that's actually probably impacting folks more than we realize too. Because it's in our water supply, but it's also coming out through semen. It's, it's coming out. And I know this because women that I was treating their husbands with testosterone replacement therapy, the women would report getting male pattern acne and start getting symptoms of high testosterone. So I knew it was coming through, and pheromonally, there might be an exchange too, but I knew it was coming through potentially the semen there. I mean, that would be the only route. And so there has to be other drugs coming through as well. Just something, I ran into things. Oh, it's, that, it's, but... it's interesting. It gets me to think about this interview I had with Chris Hansen again on PFAS, because it's a very gnarly compound. It's fluorine gas slammed together with, with carbon molecules, and it has a hydrophilic side and a hydrophobic side. Oh, we have, it's a forever chemical, so yeah. we have no idea, and it doesn't exist in nature. Thank you for producing it, uh, people. And good job, you didn't see Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you've infected everybody. And so, there's no current way we think we can do it environmentally to some scientists. I know drive it into oblivion with enough energy and, and, and break apart all the chemical bonds. But humans, you have no idea. And then she said something very interesting. She goes, we don't know, but we do know a way the mother gets rid of more of the people. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where it gets really gnarly. So you're a mom and you've got this foreign chemical, which by the way, the kid already has it. So yeah. they both record anyway. But your 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 body is discharging it more through the milk. Yes. Into the baby. So now the baby is getting even more of it. And you there's nothing currently we know even how to stop it. That to me is just again the symptom of such short sightedness, mm -hmm. uh, the sightedness for us as humans, and we just flippantly do this stuff over the God of our prophet, right? Well, it makes me wonder too, and going back to what I was saying, and that's why I brought it up with you, is because I know you'd appreciate it with the toxicity piece. I wonder if, like, my husband gets up in diesel fuel, and he's up in, I mean, every day with tractors, and, yeah. and he comes home just reeking, like, I'm just like pouring the little bit of into him and yeah. making him take the clothes off outside and get in the shower, because I'm like, what did you get into? You know, and who knows? Sometimes he sprays the farm, and it's a big property, and I don't know. I try not to think about it, but I always wonder, is that impacting me directly? Is that coming through him into me? after these things have absorbed into his skin so quickly and am I getting dosed with it through intimacy. So like that's just a it's just an aspect no one's talking about and I think about it all the time because I really wonder not only with pharmaceuticals, but what is going on and are we even is anyone even pondering this as a right. another route? Well common sense will tell you like if it's in that person, it's just it's a bit on their skin which then is in their blood and, and whatever tissue that toxin needs to store it, hide it, like whether it's directly in, it's setting off changes metabolically in that yeah, person. Yeah, so there's these metabolic impacts that are happening. Most of my followers are women. I really wonder, and I ask my female patients, like, what's your husband's health like? What is he up in all day? What do you think he's toxic with, you know? Yeah. Because this is probably going to be impacting them, I believe. Just yeah. a hypothesis. I know. Well, it's, it's again, things to think about. And it's like, number one, 
You don't want your husband to be exposed to this stuff. No. I mean, it's, you know, and so we want to, again, we want to minimize, can't do it overnight. Do you want to minimize exposures? We just want to do our best within this weird ass world. <laughs> you know, we just do our best. Don't get into paralysis, just make a choice. Yeah. You know, filter your water and start there and set the sleep better, work out relationships, be a human. Yeah. Uh, like, and get outside. Yeah. And I, I really think that, I always think back to this, I think just having the goal of being tan and jacked, like if folks yeah, just really yeah. focus on being tan and jacked, like getting adequate sunlight. Okay, let's talk about And it. getting adequate muscle movement and, and function and, you know, strength. Strength is so important. That's the other piece. Everybody wants to build muscle. It's about strength. I'm less concerned about building muscle than I used to be. I'm far, that was aesthetic. I'm far more concerned about my strength. And is my strength declining? Is it increasing? That is the longevity ticket. Right. So. And there's a couple of ways you can do that, right? So, cause I had, uh, Danny Galpin. Um, and he, it's so interesting when you talk to him, he's like, that just, he kept, he knows so much, but then he just goes, no, just move. Yeah. Like, he thinks it like, yeah, but do we go really heavy? Do we do a lot of reps to fail? He goes, nah, just, I mean, yeah, if you're really going to be an athlete, then you get married, but, but move your body through space, right? Yeah. But I, I do, I like moving heavy weight. I'd like to do that stuff. And I, you know, and, and also even today I did legs and I just nonstop did rest, tons of reps and blew myself up that way. And sometimes I'll just slow down, do some deadlifts and squats and, you know, take, and there's a lot of, I just have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about how important muscle is for a second. Just like, I just love it because I've always been an athlete. I just want to be strong. And to your point, I'll just make this point. There was a horse near you know, that was, I was living at a place when I was super food hunting. I'm always leaving and I lived in this fucking cabin and there was a horse behind me. <laughs> and this horse literally would eat when it was, at the end of the day, it was 10 feet from my bedroom window and we became buddies. And he was old. And every once in a while, he'd lay down to sleep and cook it up. Oh. I don't know, arthritis, it was four in the morning. I get up. And I'm like, I look for his head, I don't see it. Like he fell over. No. Right? And so we cook it up. So it's either called that or you eventually put him down. So I figure out a way to flip him over. Oh. Right? Flip him over, get some momentum, run on the other side, put my shoulder into him so he could like take a break, get some breath, and then get back up. Oh. I use that as an example because it's the best example I know because it's helping another being. And he's a big ass horse. And it's that idea of function. I want to be able to function when there's something going on. Mm -hmm. Right? At the end of the day, that's what strength is for. Like every so often when I'm leaving my property, a tree fell. I have to move that tree. I'm going to get a chainsaw. I got to pull it. I got to do something. I like that. I want to be able to move a rock and move a stone, jump on a tractor, do, do stuff. Yeah. And respond mostly to like, if there's something there, you know, every so often someone runs on my property and I get into that zone, I'm like, okay, two German shepherds and me are going to get in front wherever the hell is, you know? And then there's that also that male side that comes out and go, okay, I might be in a fight right now. Yeah. Like, but, but I say that because muscle comes in, because of that strength, you're confident in that point. You're, you're, you, you know, you have this function because I've, you know, probably a million hours of strength training in my yeah, life. Yeah. Right? So, oh, yeah. so talk to me about, especially the woman's side, because we still, women still lose track of like, I'm afraid of this and I'm afraid of that. And lay that out for me. What, what, how do you think is the best use of activating that muscle? And what would you like to say to women around? Well, my intro to strength training was my mentor. And he was telling me back in the early 90s to give up cardio and lift weights. And I thought he was nuts. And I didn't really listen to him. This was in the 90s. 90s. Wow, that was, yeah. Because yeah. I was like. He told me to stop eating white foods at lunch that they put me to sleep. Stop eating refined carbs. 
So he took me out to lunch and I got pasta. And then a few hours later back at the clinic, he came up to me. I was falling asleep at my desk. But he put his hand on my shoulder. He's like, how are you doing? <laughs> Lesson learned, right? And he told me to lift weights and he told me to get the cardio. And my feet were so pale and the blood flow was so bad at the time. I wasn't exercising. And he would check my capillary refill on my feet and it wasn't good. And he's like, well, you're not... I mean, you're 22 and your feet have compromised circulation. I was like, whatever. And then I went through pregnancy and that didn't go over. I mean, that was not an easy time and I didn't bounce back very well. And then went through nature path at college, still wasn't really strength training, doing some Pilates here and there. I do love Pilates. I think there's utility there, but it's not going to be the most that you want. And then he got sick and was dying. He had cancer and he was dying. And my MO when I'm really stressed out is to waste away. And I could not afford to waste away. I was a single mom. I was I was trying to build my practice and I could not waste away. And so I started training. I literally started training for his death so that I wouldn't completely fall apart when he died physically. And I also was right around 40 and I knew menopause had been a disaster for my mom. Like I told you, she got metabolic dysfunction and it just was night and day and very quickly. And I knew it was a disaster for most of the women in my family. So I started training for menopause and I was serious. I was like, I need to build a body. Training for menopause. That's going to be the name of my book. I there, you go. Like, it. there was a butt and some thighs that needed to be built and I needed to not feel like if I fell over, I was going to shatter. I was in my thirties. I was really thin. I'd always been really thin. I thought that was the goal. That was the generation we grew up in. I was like, well, I can still fit in the same jeans from high school. I must be doing something right. But I was all fat and bone and my metabolic markers on my labs looked terrible. And there's a real phenomenon called TOFI or skinny fat, which is thin on the outside, fat on the inside. Those folks are actually more at risk for death from all causes, all cause mortality risk goes up when you're thin and metabolically busted than when you're overweight and metabolically busted. So I was just sitting in a bad place. And so I started trying to pack my muscle as best I could. And I was under eating still because I'd come in a lifelong anorexic and really, I, it just is a whole generation. Like just be skinny at whatever expense. And then when it doesn't work, they wonder why, you know, their bodies are sort of blowing up on them. And that's when their metabolism has gone sideways. But I was still I think I was actually cachexic. I think I was wasting from excess cortisol. So I was able to maintain this thin, you know, physique. So I started training and then I was like, holy smokes, there's some good stuff happening in my body. Like my brain leveled out. I want to eat again. My, my lifelong anorexia was dwindling away. My sleep was improved. My relationships were improved. My, my income skyrocketed. My career took off. Everything was better. I would walk into a room and the amount of respect I received for being fit was night and day different than when I was just skinny. And I noticed this because I was in the orthopedic world and it was all me and a bunch of dudes. <laughs> so I had to command some respect. Otherwise, they would just dismiss me. Like, who's this little naturopathic girl doing her prolotherapy in her clinic? And I'm like, I'm kicking some serious ass in my clinic, by the way, but y'all can keep up whatever you're doing. And I just was so blown away. I started researching muscle. And I was around that time I met Gabrick, Dr. Gabriel Lyon, became friends with her, met you, became friends with you. And the data is in, and I think it's becoming much more popular. I think people are hearing it. I think we're hearing it on a much bigger scale. But what I'm still seeing is in our age cohort, in the middle aged woman, she has some jazzercise, pink dumbbell image in her head from days of yore and she is not taking this seriously and so what i find from my followers all the time that breaks my heart is they message me and they say dr tina i've been listening to you since 2020 and i'm doing all the things i'm going for the walks and i'm eating the you know getting the protein macros in and i'm going to sleep and i'm doing all the things and then they say and now i'm going to start strength training and this is after they've lost 40, 50, 60, 80 pounds, which is great because during the pandemic, I was just trying to get people more resilient. So I was just, I'm like, go out in the sun, you know, eat some whole foods, eat big tree dense foods, lift some heavy weights, do all the, and, but you start with the strength training. That's not the last thing you do. Yeah, to go. And this is why that 40 to 60 to 80 pounds they lost 
was a significant amount of muscle mass as well as fat because they weren't preserving their muscle. And they're like, now I'm going to start strength training. And I'm like, no, you start with the strength training. You hire the strength and conditioning coach. You fire your functional medicine doctor and you take that money and you hire a strength and conditioning coach. You will get way more bang for your buck out of it, I promise. And you quit worrying about all the supplements and you start eating real food and you do everything you can to prioritize that beautiful muscle you're working so hard for and you're paying somebody to help you build. And I promise you the whole world will change. And now any therapy that functional medicine doctor applies will actually work. Instead of you going around in circles with a bunch of freaking supplements, because mostly I'm not trying to throw my crew under the bus, but most of my functional medicine friends do not lift weights. They're functional medicine doctors and they're not lifting themselves. And they, then they tell me, I'm going to start strength training soon. And I'm like, that's what you said three years ago. So I know that they're not, like, when you don't do it and you don't have the superpower of strength, you don't get it. Like, you don't understand what that holds. Like, everything you just explained from a male standpoint, I feel that from a female standpoint. I mean, I just know at the end of the day, if someone's going to come and try to fuck with me, at least I have a Friday chance. Yeah. I know I'm skinny. I'm not as well muscled as I want to be. I've been dealing with some injuries and, you know, life and age and stress. But it's always on the front burner. Of, like, that's priority. And without it, you are a sitting duck metabolically. You're sitting duck with your hormones. And frailty is the number one killer in old age. It's, I mean, that's it. So, and you're losing a significant amount of muscle mass and the ability to lose or build muscle as you age. So like, this is an uphill, directly uphill battle that if you are not taking head on day by day, you are on the losing end of it. And I don't want to end up, I mean, frailty is what took most people out in the past few years. Nobody wants to talk about the data, but the data clearly show that those who are frail and those who are not exercising, just the slightest amount of exercise significantly improved outcomes with that virus and significantly improved your, like your risk for going even into the hospital or ICU or death was significantly lower. If folks just exercise and we have data from all over the world and it wasn't even any specific kind of exercise. It wasn't even strength training. It was just like, if people got 150 minutes of exercise a week, they were pretty much fine. That's what the data kept showing all over the place. So start wherever you start, but prioritizing muscle is like, that's the ticket. Look, if you add up, yeah, if you added up all the benefits of making strength, it would blow you away. If we listed like the quintessential commercial, yeah. if we listed all the benefits, you would be like, oh my God. And literally all you have to do is move yourself through space. Move your legs around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's we talk. Need, we need to make that commercial. We let's, need to make it like the drug commercial. Let's do that. Let's do it. <laughs> we'll list off. Instead of the horrific side effects that you hear and that they speed up really bad. Yeah, yeah. We'll so, slow it down. Yeah. We'll slow it down. <laughs> We'll slow up for where and be like, and it will go on and on. And your sex life will be better. Yes. Your money will, your income will increase probably. Your confidence. Yeah. yeah. Like your success you're reinforcing. Will. Yeah. I mean, listen, gravity is pretty resilient, right? And life is pretty resilient. So if we can move through space and activate ourselves and gain, I, I, I think of women too. I've heard, you know, I, I listen and I'm like, for some reason, the last five years, I really listen to how fragile, not from the internal, but how gnarly it is to be a woman just moving around big cities, all of that stuff, the radar that's always up. Always. It's always, always. And as a guy, we will virtually never know that, right? I have traveled all over the world and I know when there's danger. Like I'm like, okay, okay. I shifting into this gear right now. I can't imagine always having that almost to, okay. It's, it's just dark out. I gotta walk to my car. And like, so I say that only to say what your point was, like the confidence it gives you is not just the confidence, but it's actual, it's actual like defense. Yeah. Right. At least I know I have a fighting chance. It may not be great, but. Having my husband, that's why my husband was everywhere with me now, because that going through the world was exhausting. And I didn't realize it until he showed up. And I 
I've had other husbands and they were not very protective. They were not very good at protecting me nor making me feel safe. And he makes me feel incredibly safe. And the minute that safety net showed up, I was like, oh, this is so much easier this way. And I didn't realize the amount of effort I had to put out all the time to, you know, but at least being strong, you walk around with, you know, a bit broader, taller shoulders and you look a little less like a target. Right. You know, there's something there and, and you feel a bit of confidence, like at least I'm going to go down scrapping it out. You know? <laughs> That's a beautiful just example of just the the balance, too, of the male female. The, the, the man wants to do that. And just by his nature, he's like, hey, look good. Just by him being around, it already puts that vibe out, right? It's so good. And, it's and, so much better. Yeah, I love that. And Let's quickly talk about semi-glutide okay. and, uh, and Ozempic and that whole thing. I haven't dug a ton into this other than when I saw, and we're kind of going back to this, this side of the muscle, when I saw some of the evidence that people were also losing, I think up to 20% of their muscle mass in certain instances, that scared the shit out of me, yeah. right? So, so okay, you're you're. I'm sure it's not across the board, but you're 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 increasing your fat suit, but you're less weight, and so the ratios get off. So anyway, let's. There's some pluses and minuses to it. Obviously, if you're morbidly obese, maybe there's 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 maybe a nuance here. Um, what's your thought on this whole? You know, because this is the closest thing we get to the hill, right. too, right? Right. So I decided to do a podcast about it about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And I was not going to do it without researching it because I'm not going to talk out my butt about something I don't know. And I saw a bunch of friends and colleagues and an online influencers taking a firm stance publicly about it was epic. And they were all repeating the same thing. I was like, did y'all read the same blog post? Because it's all sounded the same. And that really made me raise an eyebrow. Like, you know, after living through the past few years, you start to see propaganda. And I was like, something doesn't smell right. So I started researching it and I immediately started researching the neurocognitive benefits. And because it was originally developed for neurodegeneration, they just happened to find out that it helped with type 2 diabetes. Oh, wow. That was the second. For yes. And then they only just figured out that weight loss was a thing many years later. So I was so floored by what I was finding about neurodegeneration and its ability to regenerate neurons in the brain, its ability to decrease inflammation in the brain, its ability to have all kinds of impacts on long-term, not just dementia, but the way that, so my background, when I was an undergrad, I was working in an Alzheimer's and dementia clinic. So I knew all about like the amyloid plaques and the tau proteins and all of that. And there was, animal data showing, and then current uh, studies happening on humans showing really profound impacts on protection against all of that. And I was like, this is not what they're telling us. I'm not hearing about this anywhere. And then the next thing I started researching was pain because that's my wheelhouse, right? Like that's my clinic. That's what all I did forever. And pain comes from the brain. So if we can turn down neuroinflammation, if we can get those microglial cells to chill out, pain usually secondarily is dealt with to some degree and the impacts on pain. And then I went into the musculoskeletal system because that's my wheelhouse and regenerative medicine. And it turns out that they have a healing anti-inflammatory and regenerative impact on muscle, joints, tendons and ligaments and bone. And I was like, this is not what we're hearing. So this, the percentages of muscle loss that you're caring about are actually lean mass loss. And so they're looking at lean mass overall muscle is part of your lean mass. And they are concerning, right? It's like 20 to 25, up to 35, some studies showing 40% lean mass loss. That is on par with anybody who's put into a really low calorie state. So if you drop a patient into a severely calorically restricted diet, they will lose that percentage, not fleeting mass. It's on par with bariatric surgery as well. It's not the peptide. The peptides actually maybe even has an anabolic impact. So it, perf it helps with hyperperfusion of the tissue. So you get better vasculature into the muscle to deliver amino acids. So it's not the peptide, it's the 
low calorie state. And so that got me thinking about dosing. And I it just in a nutshell, I very firmly believe that this peptide, it, as a part of all the other peptides, like you probably are familiar with BPC-157, all these other regenerative peptides, sure, sure, sure. this is also in that wheelhouse. Over here in the allopathic community, the way it's being used for type 2 diabetes and weight loss is, I believe they're starting most folks on too high a dose, and I think that dose is getting ramped up way too high, and it's too fast. And so it's a signaling peptide hormone in the body, just like insulin is, just like leptin is and ghrelin is. If we crank somebody up on insulin, we would kill them. So I think that the way it's being applied is a little bit off target. I think for some people it's a life changer, but even in the case of somebody who really, really needs it for weight loss, cranking somebody up on a super, super high dose just because the study said so, and having them drop that, you know, crushing your appetite out and then having them drop that kind of muscle is a recipe for disaster. So my argument has been, and there is a different way to do this, and it involves much lower doses using a compound pharmacy and applying this peptide for cardiovascular disease, for neurocognition, a bunch of other conditions that we might be able to use this for successfully. And I am using it in clinic that way. Much lower doses, no side effects, none of the stuff we're hearing about. So it's like almost two conversations that are separate, you know? Now does, now from a peptide to semi-glutide to ozempic, ozempic, is there formula changes within that or is it best to use the peptide alone or how is it formulated in the Ozempic So semaglutide is a GLP-1 agonist and we make our own GLP-1 in our body. We make it in our L cells, we make it in our brain. It's a 36 amino acid chain. So a peptide for the audience listening is just a chain of amino acids. And it's not a drug. It just got co-opted by Big Pharma for some reason. It's also available by compound pharmacies. Semaglutide is the generic name for Ozempic and Wegovy, and then Terzepatide is the generic name for Longelo and Zepbound. Semaglutide is bioidentical to the version our body makes. It just has a bit of a tweak on it to give it a longer half-life. So there, it stays in the body and does not get broken down as quickly. And that's the same with the compounded version. It's the same with the, you know, big pharma version. They just have theirs in a pen that's pre-filled and you can't control the dose. So the dose comes the way it comes. And I think a lot of folks are starting out on that initial dose and it's way too high and it's shoving them into a lot of unfavorable side effects, which are completely avoidable if done a different way. And so we might apply it to help a middle-aged woman with insulin resistance. And there might be some weight loss, but I'm trying to optimize her metabolism. I'm trying to optimize her insulin signaling and her insulin reception. I'm trying to help with the inflammation that a lot of this is, you know, middle age causes a lot of inflammation in the body. Aging just causes inflammation. And I'm trying to help them in a variety of different ways. And in some ways preventative, like my husband's on it because he has high blood pressure and a major family history of heart disease. I just don't want him to drop dead. I'm on it because there's a lot of neurocognitive issues in my family, MS, dementia, heart disease, don't want any of it, right? And so that's the argument I've been making for it. And it seems to be getting some airplay because people are like, wait a minute, this is not, you know, this version over here is like a whole different song and dance. It's like, yeah, it's the dose is the medicine of the poison. Yeah, the dose makes the poison. Right. So. That's that's where I'm glad that you made that distinction. And I'm also glad that you dug into the the research there because I, you know just the the main dosing of slamming people into this yes. stuff seems a little obviously it's gonna have some side effects. Losing that amount of weight that fast that's going to be a disaster at the end of that yeah. journey. And they're using it as monotherapy, so but, meaning it's just that's all they're you know it's. This is your one peptide and we're gonna crank it up and hope for the best. In the regenerative medicine space in the world of peptides and biohacking space, we're usually using a stack of peptides. So we're using muscle protective peptides, we're using anti-inflammatory peptides, we're trying to have an impact on the immune system. This is a whole 
comprehensive, there's usually some bioidentical hormone replacement going on, and not just to replace hormones, but for longevity. Touches of testosterone, touches of thyroid, to optimize the individual and really make sure that they're aging well, and that cellularly there's communication happening the way it's supposed to, going back to our very beginning, what is metabolism, making sure mitochondria and everything else are working, and then over here we're seeing just a different version, and I think it is getting a bad rap because that is a bad rap. It's not a substitute for lifestyle. And that's all the things we've discussed in the past hour have got to be part of it, non-negotiable. The strength training is non-negotiable. The eating whole foods is non-negotiable. The living, the, you know, the mitigation of the stress, the living your super life, right? Like that's all part of it. It's been co-opted in this pharmaceutical way. I'm talking physiologic, very different. And they're also talking individual. When you're yeah. talking, you know, the hyper individuality that you're talking about is different than this, this, in this sense, since this passive dose that we're just going to give everybody. And, and, and that's where all those things, whether they're from health or pharmaceutical, that's where things go silos all the time. Yes. And, and even our, the TikToking health providers that are just saying the same thing. And it's like, that's not, that's not true. <laughs> it's just not. It's just not true. And like, of course, you can get away with go to sleep from seven to nine hours. So, like, I just recently, this is my third tangent. I just recently saw some quote unquote experts on sleep saying now they're saying the opposite. They're like, no, 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 uh, four hours of sleep. Four? I'm like, what are you talking oh, about? I, like, I, I, I die like, at four. <laughs> I mean, like, and like, it's, I don't know if it's some male aggro thing in order to buy it off of that. So. They're telling guys not to ejaculate either. It's, I don't know what's going on. Right. The whole online health influencer space yeah, is yeah. a little crazy sometimes. Yeah, I don't know. I, I try to play the game like you do, but also we, I can see you and I over there like, I'm just trying to hold oh, down the common sense. <laughs> oh my God. And I like, I just, okay, I'm not going to respond. Don't respond. And that's what grabbed me about this peptide. It, that's simply the message I'm trying to deliver is I do think that there's a place that can be phenomenally helpful for so many people if it were done more appropriately. And I don't want folks, and there are some folks who do need higher doses, especially if they're severely metabolically compromised, they're definitely needing higher doses. And I'm seeing that clinically. And I've just got messages, hundreds and hundreds of messages from people saying, you know, I was so scared to take this. My doctor really wanted me on it. and since listening to your content, I changed my tune and here's this amazing transformation story. But they're doing all the things because they listen to me and they know and they listen to folks like you and they know they need to do the strength training and all the pieces. I just wanted to make sure to add in that piece of the combo because we've got this click baby. There's a lot of industries profiting off of type 2 diabetes and obesity. A lot. It's a, it's a very big uh, income source for a whole variety of industries. It, these peptides also make people not want to drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes. So there's influence, I think, here on the clickbaity media, you know, mainstream media headlines that it just is a jive in with what these pile. I've been doing nothing but researching this peptide for a year, and I'm like, this is my yeah. Right. <laughs> so last couple questions for you from. From your worldview right now, what makes a super life? What makes a super life? Well, you know, I'm leaning more and more to the fact that I need to get out of Oregon and I need to get to the sun. I think sun, I think light, not just sun, but light. I think light exposure, being outside, not just nature, but literally just even if you live in an urban area, like getting outside is such a key component to it. Good relationships. Especially again, going back to the people you spend the most time with, the healthy, being around other healthy folks. If you're trying to attain health, being around healthy people really, really matters. Finding that community is absolutely key. Otherwise, you will slip back into bad habits. Um, and just mitigating the stress again, that's kind of been the theme for me the last year is like getting off that cortisol roller coaster because it's really easy to get caught up in what's happened, feeling frustrated, feeling angry that you know i mean that was a bit of a side and a lot of people got duped into it and there's people so angry still wanting apologies and wanting you know people to come out and express things they're never going to express so just realizing that we're humans and humans don't hang out to pain well 
humans want to forget the pain that they've endured. So a lot of people are forgetting intentionally right now. We need to move forward and not hanging on to that resentment and anger and, and that chronic cortisol pump, I think is really the only way. So like you said, get out of, like you do, you travel, getting out of whatever your current circumstances, finding opportunities to leave that and go see other things in other places. And you're that with people. I was just in London and I'm like, it's not so bad. The world's not so bad. Humans aren't so bad. My car was just in New York and she's like, it was great. Humans are great. The park was great. The subway was great. You know, humans, humans are not so bad. It's true. And that's, and I think that's a beautiful message because I do believe that we, we have good intentions. The general person wants life. They want to live a great life. They want to be happy. They want other people to be happy. We want to get along. We want to, like, I do believe that. I do too. You know, so if we just keep creating community in that way, that I think we get, and I think we are making changes. The other world will continue yep. doing what it's doing, but I get excited about this idea of coming together and creating a utopian world. And I don't mean that either as far out there. I mean that literal as let's have these conversations, let's get more and more people together to, to further the stance. And I always say we have we have the numbers. We do. I think that folks need to really embrace their inner warrior know their inner strength and get their body to match that because we need people healthier. We really need people healthier. We cannot stand up for medical autonomy and fight Goliath if we are physically compromised. And that drop both mics. We need warriors. That's all I got. <laughs> Everyone hear that? We need warriors. Yes. Right. We need we need health so that we can create the kind of life that we want, not just you know, to it. Yeah, it's vitality. Yeah. One on one. I mean, that's naturopathic medicine is vitality, right? Yeah. You gotta stoke your vitality. So all the things we've discussed in this conversation, you know, we gotta stoke the vitality. Well, what the stoke? <laughs> Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to talk with you. Many more conversations to be had. Yes, thank you for having me. It was so fun.